Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, we are going to be covering the classes and specializations in Guild Wars 2 very briefly today, just so that you guys can get uh, an overview of, uh, of what to expect from these classes. Before we get started, uh, I have actually done this overview in the PvP lobby itself, simply because I don't have to level every single character to level 80. I can just go in and test out these classes. And I haven't actually provided any build information in any of this, because that's not the focus of this video. To be clear, I will be giving a brief introduction as to how the class operates or what its intent is, and maybe a little bit of class law, and then we'll be looking at the types of damage that it's best known for doing. If you do want in-depth class guides, then you need to look somewhere else. Let's get started. Of course, you do have to pick a race first, but it doesn't really matter what you pick. This ultimately comes down to your personal preference on what you want your character to look like. Every single race in the game has the same opportunities. So just play what you like. First up, we have the Warrior. Warrior is actively used in all game modes and is actually quite easy to understand. It can be both offensive and defensive, and it's relatively durable in both states. Just as a note, I haven't included Core Warrior in this video. I don't feel that Core Warrior is actually vastly different to Berserker or Spellbreaker Warrior in its style of play. A Core Warrior generates adrenaline, and a Berserker generates rage. The only difference being that Core Warrior does not have a Berserk state. As a Berserker, you gain additional damage whilst in this Berserk state, and it does a lot of AoE damage. Berserker is commonly used as a banner slave in PvE. Consider it like a damage dealing buffer. And then in PvP, it's pure AoE cheese. And now we have Spellbreaker. Spellbreaker is the type of warrior that actually benefits from counterattacking its foes. Similarly to Core Warrior, it does still generate adrenaline. It is both an offensive and defensive playstyle. And of course, it can do a lot of damage. In PvP, it's currently used as a side node, a duelist. And in raids and PvE, it's used as a power DPS source. As you've seen, there's not really a vast difference between all these different specs. But the playstyles are slightly different. Now let's look at Guardian. Guardian is actively used in all game modes, easy to understand, and operates similarly to Paladins in other MMORPGs. Via use of all the specs, Guardian can actually be offensive, defensive, and it can play a support role. And funnily enough, this was actually the first class that I ever played when I came to Guild Wars 2. And in this instance, I have actually included Core Guardian footage. The sad thing is that Core Guardian doesn't really see play outside of PvP. Before Firebrand was a thing, Core support did actually exist. So unfortunately now, Core Guardian essentially just exists as a rotational damage source in PvP. It has access to a lot of anti-condition output, as well as high power burst and teleportation skills. It gains benefit from its passive virtues on the F1, F2, and F3 skills, and those can also be activated for additional benefit. Dragon Hunter is actually very similar to Core Guardian. The only difference being that the virtues have slightly changed, and now you have access to a longbow. Of course, you do gain additional skills, like traps, which are actually the main staple of the Dragon Hunter damage source. And you still have access to a lot of your teleportation skills and offensive and supportive utilities. Dragon Hunter is actually used as one of the highest damage dealers in raids at the moment, and is even used by a handful of players in PvP up towards Legendary. And now finally we have Firebrand. Firebrand is the Guardian spec that replaced core Guardian support. I'd go as far as to say that the Firebrand healing kit is so far healing creeped that nothing can really compete with it as a support in the current game state. Your virtues, your F1 to F3 skills, have been replaced with tomes. Healing predominantly comes from your tome of resolve, the F2, and your boon distribution comes from your F3, which is your tome of courage. The build is designed to sustain other people, but yourself as well. So some PvPers play Firebrand as a side noder, and others play it as a team-based support. And in PvE, this is also the case. You can play as a high damage condition output, or you can support your team with healing and boon distribution. And now Revenant. Revenant is a class that's only accessible if you have either of the expansions. Revenant isn't one of the easiest classes in the game, but it's not that hard either. It's used in every single game mode and does have a bunch of different playstyles. Now, the way I'm gonna look at this is from a stance perspective. 
The way the Revenant plays is more so dependent on the stance that the Revenant is currently using. In this instance, we have Ventari Herald. The Herald Elite comes from the Heart of Thorns expansion, but Ventari is known as the support stance for Revenant. Ventari Revenant in the past has been used as a side node bunker in PvP and a PvE support. Ventari Revenant gains access to a tablet that it uses to pulse heals and benefit the player underneath the tablet. Ventari Revenant used to be the go-to bunker. It also used to be one of the best supports in the game. Again, with the addition of Firebrand support, this is now no longer the case. Now, the Herald stance comes from Heart of Thorns. Herald is more about being able to maintain boon up time and spread that with your team. If you can see just to the left of the health ball in the middle, you'll see the upkeep. And that is almost like the ammunition for Revenant skills. Revenants regularly change stances in the middle of their combat. And this is typically to counter the lack of upkeep that they have. The Herald Shiro combo is mainly used in PvP as a rotational plus one and is currently the highest burst damage in the game for that role. But you never see this in PvE. And here we have Renegade Malix. Malix is another one of the core stances, by the way. It just so happens to be condition based, and this is why it works well with Renegade. Renegade basically summons spirits, as you can see, to just distribute conditions and damage underneath their position. They expire when killed or after a certain duration. Renegade does still use upkeep as the majority of its skill usage, and it is a very commonly used PvE DPS class. It's sometimes used as a side node duelist in PvP, but not very regularly. As a quick note, I have not covered every single stance or every single combo in this video. There are other core stances that I could cover, but I just want to be able to save time here, so I've done a very general approach to some of the builds that are used today. You can find more class information on the Wikipedia or in other YouTube videos. Now, let's move on to Ranger. Ranger is typically easy to understand, but it does have some complexities on the likes of Druid and Soul Beast. It's actively used in all game modes, both as supports and power and condition DPS sources, and does well in both PvP and PvE scenarios. Druid is from the Heart of Thorns expansion pack and is mainly used in PvE content. The healing and utility provided in PvE by this build is actually very, very strong. Good healing from ranged, combined with some damage sources and multiple different pets that you can use to aid your scenarios, makes this spec very unique and very useful. In PvP, it's sometimes used by a handful of players to just side node bunker. The combination of CC and healing power in PvP does make this quite an annoyance on a side node. That said, at present, they don't do excessively well into some of the power creep. And now we have Soul Beast. Soul Beast grants the ability to merge with its pet, and then your F1 to F3 abilities change. Sometimes these are offensive, and sometimes they're defensive, but usually they're based around the actual output of the pet that you've chosen. Additionally, this is enforced by the utilities and weapon kit available to the Soul Beast. Soul Beast is actually actively used in all game modes in multiple different roles. Soul Beast is used as a rotational plus one or side noder in PvP, and also as a Condi or Power DPS in PvE and Raids. This spec does have a lot of variety to it. As a note, I have not included Core here because I don't feel that it's vastly different to Soul Beast. Now, here we have Thief. Thief is semi-complex, and PvP does require game knowledge. It has high PvE damage, but no team utility. It's also locked to a DPS playstyle. So, sadly, Core Thief doesn't actually have any PvE play at all. The kit available to it just does not put it into a PvE setting. However, it does have usage in PvP. Core Sword Dagger Thief has been the main go-to since, I'd say, about three seasons ago. It has good positional teleportation engage and good plus one kit on the sword. So Daredevil and Core Thief aren't vastly different. The obvious difference is that Daredevil gains another dodge roll and also does have more utility to enable it into stealth. In PvP, it does have slightly less damage output though, so people are playing it less. In PvE, however, it does have some of the highest single target damage going. The only downside to that is that it doesn't actually have any team utility at all, and therefore it doesn't bring anything to raids besides its damage. 
in most cases anyway. For the sake of it, I've added on some staff gameplay here just so you can see a little bit of the playstyle. There's a lot of flip-flopping involved, but it's quite a fun class. Now, the one thing that I do actually really like about Deadeye is that Deadeye really changes the way that the Thief plays. Thief is typically a melee class, so when you add in what Deadeye brings, it now turns a melee class into something ranged. The downside to this is that it can be perceived as quite cheesy, and in PvP, it's quite easy to counter. I personally use this build when I don't want to get too close to a world boss, but I still want to be participating. With the right traits, you can hit for around 65,000 damage on one of those sniper shots. And of course, that damage scales with the amount of malice stacks that you have above your health ball, which you may have just seen. Now, Engineer is probably one of the first ones that we've come across that's quite complex. Much like some other classes, this is kind of like playing a piano sometimes. The good news is that this does offer a variety of different playstyles and is actively used in PvP and PvE. And it does get a bit easier as you go on. Now, Core Engineer does have a lot of kit, uh, and I, I mean, that's quite a joke, actually, because it does have a lot of kits. Uh, we're currently using Elixir Gun, Flamethrower, Bomb Kit, and Mortar Kit. And of course, each one of those kits has another five buttons that you need to memorize. Now, those buttons would become part of your natural rotation combined with those uh, tool belt skills that you can see on the F1, F2, F3, F4, and F5. This spec can be played in both Condi and Power variants, but it doesn't really see gameplay anywhere in the game. The only place where I see Core Engineer being played is in PvP with a cheesy Core Grenade one-shot build. And honestly, the reason being for this is it's just so clunky and hard to actually use. Now, the base kit of the Scrapper is intended for it to be a sort of a tank. The hammer kit is based around being CC based, so the hammer 5 is a stun, they have deflection on hammer 2, evade frame on hammer 3, and a block on hammer 4. The gyros are little machines that float around the scrapper that give them little buffs, so bulwark gyro is a barrier, the medic gyro does healing around them, and stealth gyro is the elite that gives them an AoE stealth field. I for one do still find this quite clunky to play, however it does see some usage in both PvP and PvE. And the usage can vary from a support to a side note a duelist. And then after seeing all that clunkiness, now you're going to be introduced to Hollowsmith. Hollowsmith is fluid, crazy amounts of damage and sustainability and it works in all game modes. It's based on the premise that you click your F5, which takes you into your Photon Forge, and it gives you access to a series of holographic weapons. You have a bar where you generate heat, and if you overheat, then you take damage. A lot of damage. Next up, we have Necromancer. Necromancer is quite a popular class, and it's relatively simple to understand. The class bases itself around life force generation, it then uses that life force to put itself into some form of transformation or to use certain abilities. Necromancer has both a DPS and hybrid playstyle. Essentially, Necromancers use abilities to gain life force. They then use that life force to gain access to Reaper Shroud, which is on their F1 skill. They then gain access to new skills, which will do crowd control, AoE damage, and so on and so forth. After depleting their life force, they're forced to use their original weapon skills once again. This has very little PvE involvement, but has good options in PvP. Now, Reaper operates very similarly to that of the Core Necromancer. It's something that generates life force and then uses it to... Uh... Sorry, where was I? So yes, the Reaper generates life force from their attacks and then uses that life force whilst in Reaper stance to apply a lot of AoE damage. The main difference is that Reaper is much more bursty than that of Core Necromancer. And this specialization is very, very strong in both PvP and PvE. Now, Scourge Necro is slightly different in the sense that they use their life force generation to put out damage through their shades. So the F1 places a shade, and then they expel that through the F2, F3, F4, and F5. These skills boon corrupt, fear, provide barrier to the Scourge and to the players around the Scourge. This means that the DPS Scourge can actually use blood magic trait lines to synergize with their barrier as well as becoming this sort of DPS hybrid support. And this increases their viability in both PvE and PvP. Now onto Elementalist. 
Elementalist is quite easily the most complex class in the game. It's hard to learn, and even with the Path of Fire expansion, the class gets even more ridiculous. It's themed around elemental attunement, so you gain access to water, fire, earth, and air, but it's just very hard to play. Corelli has a very slow playstyle and is essentially as simple as it looks. You press your attunement and you gain access to the abilities that you have attuned to. Fire is typically uh, based around conditions, air around flat power, earth around protection, and water around healing. The thing is, as Elementalist goes through the expansions, it actually becomes more complex, but also more relevant. The operations don't change drastically, but they change enough. So Tempest is very similar to Core, however it does have the opportunity to double attune or overload. As you see here, I double tap the F2, which allows me to go into the bubble, which is the water overload, and this in itself provides more additional healing for whoever's around me. Everything else operates very, very similarly. However, the kit provided is just slightly stronger than that of what it was. The downside of Tempest support is that it's overshadowed by Firebrand, and its damage is overshadowed by Weaver. And now Weaver essentially operates the same way, but when you use your attunements, you actually only swap three of your skills. The four and five become your previous attunement. So the exceptional complication of this is that you have to, at any point, memorize how two different attunements weave and also at any given point, remember what attunement you were on and think about what attunement you want to be on. You're both thinking in the past, the present and the future simultaneously. And to be honest, it's just not worth it. The output is mediocre at best, and you know sometimes it does carry in some cases, and I'll, I'll give people that, but it's just so complex for absolutely no reason whatsoever, for no reward. So if you like a challenge, go for it. And finally, we have Mesmer. Mesmer is the brainchild of ArenaNet, and for that reason, it's actually rather complex and overpowered. Long story short, the Mesmer creates copies of itself and then shatters those copies over its opponents. It's also the main raid tank in the game. Now, you're not going to see much difference between Core Mesmer, Chronomancer, and Mirage. I'm going to say that outright. All of them are based on the premise that you will create copies of yourself and shatter them to some benefit. Core Mesmer displays the very basic level of that mechanic. And of course, the trait lines will interact slightly differently with those shatters uh, compared to Chronomancer Mirage. So in this instance, we have Chronomancer. Again, Chronomancer is going to be using the illusions and phantasms to shatter onto their opponent. However, Chronomancer has the ability to use Continuum Split on the F5, which essentially brings any of the previous skills back that were used uh, prior to the Continuum Split. So what this means is that abilities can be double cast within very quick succession. Essentially, all it did was reset the cooldown. This mechanic combined with the ability to pump out boons and also block attacks with the shield makes it very viable as a PvE tank and also as a duelist in PvP. The difference again that comes with Mirage is that Mirage gains access to ambush skills, which is essentially their one ability that they get to cast after either dodging, which creates a mirror, and when they walk into a mirror. The mirror is essentially just an evade frame. This means that the Mirage is very elusive. Uh, it's, it's actually something that is very hard to lock down. The traits enable Mirage to create a lot of copies of itself almost constantly. And its abilities keep maneuvering it around its opponent almost non-stop. This mobility essentially makes this a very strong rotational plus one in PvP. And the sheer amount of shattering that it's able to do makes it a very strong DPS in PvE and raids. And just as I did with Thief, here is an alternative to playing uh, Connie Mirage. This is a power shatter Greatsword Mirage. The correct skill combination essentially one-shots your opponent. Now, that brings us to the end of the video. I've tried not to go too in-depth as far as the class specializations go, and my main focus was just to bring as much light as possible to anybody who might be brand new playing this game and want to know what the classes are like. 
So I do hope that I've done that justice, and I do hope that you guys now have a better understanding of what you can do with these classes. If you do have any further questions towards any of the classes, please write them in the comments below, and I will get to them as quickly as I can. Thank you for watching, everybody, and I'll see you in the next one.